Welcome. Nothing better to do on a Tuesday night than come out to a debate, right? <laughs> uh, as Pastor McGee said, tonight's debate is on the topic of uh, what was the message of Jesus? Now, Christians posit certain things about Jesus, and Muslims posit certain things about Jesus, and uh, tonight is an opportunity for us to come together and discuss both sides and weigh the evidence and see what it was that Jesus came to do, what was his purpose, what was his mission on this earth. Um, and with that, I will introduce our debaters tonight. On my left is David Wood. David is a former atheist who became a Christian after examining the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. He is currently the director of Act 17 Apologetics and has been in more than 30 moderated public debates. Tonight makes it 31, I guess. <laughs> David is the host of ABN's live talk show, Jesus or Muhammad. You can reach him at his blog, www.answeringmuslims.com. David, thanks for being here tonight. And on my right is Sami Zatari. Sami is an international speaker with the Muslim Debate Initiative, MDI, and has held debates in the US and the UK. Sami holds a master's in the field of Middle East politics. He currently runs two websites, muslim-responses.com, as well as ilovemuhammad.com. Thank you, Sami, for joining us tonight. Let's welcome our debaters once again. Now, the format for tonight's debate is as follows. Both David and Sammy will introduce with 20-minute uh, opening statements, and that will be followed each by a 10-minute rebuttal. Then we'll take a five-minute break for you to get up and stretch and uh, use the restrooms and such. We'll return for another set of 10-minute rebuttals, and finally, a session of Crossfire, which will last 10 minutes long in total. Uh, that means five minutes for each of our debaters consecutively. And uh, then we'll take a two minute break. And finally, we'll end with a roughly 20 to 30 minute Q&A session for you guys to get a chance to ask questions to either Sammy or David about the topic tonight. And uh, without further ado, I will give the mic over to David who will start off with opening statements. You have 20 minutes, David. Well, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, good evening. I'd like to thank uh, Pastor McGee and Harvest Bible Church for hosting our debate tonight. Uh, Christians are commanded to preach the gospel and to make disciples of all nations, and Muslims are commanded to invite everyone uh, to Islam. And you put those two teachings together and uh, you start to wonder why Christians and Muslims spend so much time walking past each other. So I'm glad to see uh, an event like this here at uh, Harvest. Uh, I'd also like to thank Sammy for representing the Muslim position. Those of you who've seen Sammy debate know that he's one of the best Muslim debaters out there, which is remarkable given his young age. And uh, you have to wonder, what could Sammy do if he had the truth on his side? And, uh, I, hope to, I hope to find out one day, my friend. Uh, our topic tonight is, what was the message of Jesus? Now, Jesus said a lot of things during his uh, three-year ministry. You can read the Sermon on the Mount, for instance. Uh, Jesus preached the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. He condemned hypocrisy. He defended social outcasts. He taught his followers to turn the other cheek and to pray for their persecutors. Uh, the Gospels are filled with uh, teachings like this. But when we talk about the message of Jesus, uh, the message of Jesus, we're talking about the core teachings of the gospel, Jesus' sacrificial death by crucifixion, his resurrection from the dead, and his divine nature. Uh, the message of Jesus is what we might call God's solution to the problem of sin. God's solution to the problem of sin. Christians believe that because God is perfect, he's perfect in his attributes. So God's not just powerful, he's all-powerful. He's not just really smart, he's all-knowing. But God is merciful and just as well, uh, meaning that his mercy and justice are perfect. And this presents a problem, because human beings sin. If God is perfectly just, then he must, by definition, punish all sin. But if he's 
uh, perfect in love and mercy, he would want to forgive us. So what's God going to do? If he sends everyone to hell, his justice would be satisfied because all sin would be punished, but that wouldn't be very loving. And if God simply forgives everyone, that would be very loving and merciful, but it wouldn't be just. So what's a perfectly just, perfectly loving God going to do when he sees a world full of sinners? Well, according to my Muslim friends, and Sammy can correct me here, uh, the solution seems to be to limit and diminish God's attributes. Muslims tell me that if you turn to Allah in repentance, He can just kind of sweep your sins under the rug and pretend they never happened. But this would mean that at the end of time, some sin hasn't been punished according to Islam. So Allah wouldn't be perfect in justice. Uh, his love and mercy wouldn't be perfect either. According to the Quran, God only loves Muslims. In the Quran we read, Allah does not love those who exceed the limits, Surah 2, 190. Allah does not love any ungrateful sinner, Surah 2, 276. Allah does not love the unbelievers, Surah 3, 32. Allah does not love the unjust, Surah 3, 57. Allah does not love him who is proud, Surah 4, 36. The Quran tells Muslims that Allah only loves those who first love him. By the way, this is the sort of love that, that is condemned by Jesus in Matthew 5. So the Islamic solution to the problem of sin, I would say, is theologically unacceptable. You can't uh, diminish God's, uh, the attributes of God's eternal nature. But Christianity handles this issue quite differently. In, in Christianity, all sin will be punished because God's justice is perfect, and yet God will forgive everyone who comes to him because he loves us. So what's the solution to this problem of sin according to Christianity? And here we come to uh, the message of Jesus. And here I just want to give kind of an, an overview. We can certainly go into uh, more detail as uh, the debate proceeds, but it's important to, to have a broad picture of Jesus' message in mind when reading the Gospels. Uh, because if we divorce a specific doctrine or belief from the larger theological context, uh, we end up with misunderstandings. For instance, uh, Christians say that Jesus is God. Uh, the, the obvious response to, something, to saying that this man, Jesus, is God would be something like, you know, Jesus is God and yet he died. How can God die? Jesus, you say Jesus is God, but he uh, ate food. Uh, you believe that Jesus is God and yet... Uh, you believe he was born of a woman. How can God be born? So these are obvious uh, objections. Um, and that's what happens if we take that, that claim that Jesus is God uh, out of its historical context. Uh, we have to include the doctrine of the incarnation. God entered his creation and took on a human nature. So what's the big picture then, according to Christianity, if we looked at the big picture of Jesus' message? Well, Christianity claims that God exists eternally as a trinity. God is one in essence or being or nature, but three in person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One of these divine persons, the Son, laid aside the glory he had with the Father and entered into creation as Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus lived as a servant and died as the perfect, faultless sacrifice for sins, then he rose from the dead, returned to his glorified state, and sits at the right hand of the Father. That's what Christians believe. Now, Muslims find several, uh, several of the claims made in uh, in that uh, core teaching uh, to be absurd. Uh, but let's assume, for argument's sake, that the Christian view were true. If it were true, it's called Bayesian reasoning, by the way, you see, if this were true, what would you expect to find? And then you go out and look and see if you find it. And if you do, that's confirmation. Uh, so the question is, uh, if Christianity were true, if this basic Christian message were true, what would we expect to find? Well, if God is a trinity, if God were a trinity, we would expect to find Jesus drawing distinctions between himself and the Father, and between himself and the Holy Spirit, and between the Holy Spirit, and the Father. And that's exactly what we find throughout the Gospels. Jesus is consistently 
um, referring to the Holy Spirit as distinct from himself. He's uh, repeatedly uh, draws attention to the Father as distinct from himself. So there is a distinction, and that certainly fits with what uh, Christians believe. Uh, so we, we do find this emphasis on the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being distinct. But the doctrine of the Trinity teaches that there's only one God. So we would expect Jesus to affirm the existence of one God. And that's exactly what we find in the Gospels. Jesus, uh, Jesus affirms the Old Testament uh, teaching that the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So there's one God, according to Jesus, and he's drawing a, a distinction among Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now we, so we have the, the core of the doctrine of the Trinity, and the question is uh, the incarnation. Now if, if God were to enter into his creation, uh, what sort of life would we expect him to live? Uh, I would expect to see the most miraculous life in history, and that's exactly what we find. Once again, Islam and Christianity agree that Jesus lived the most miraculous life in history. He had a miraculous birth. During his earthly ministry, he healed the sick and the lame, he cured lepers, he gave sight to the blind, he made the deaf hear and the mute speak, he cast out demons, he walked on water, uh, the wind and the waves obeyed his voice, he fed thousands of people with five loaves of bread and a few small fish, he raised the dead. Uh, lots of people, and by the way, as, as, a, as a former atheist, this is, this, is, uh, this is why I'm a Christian right now, lots of people down through history have claimed to be speaking on behalf of God. And if you look at Jesus, uh, if anyone in all of history spoke for God, I would say it's, it's him, uh, given the miraculous nature of his life, and especially uh, his resurrection. And so if I'm going to listen to anyone tell me about God, I'm going to listen to him. And so the question is, what was his message? And here we uh, would come to uh, a few key teachings. Jesus claims about himself, and this would be essential. Um, if Jesus were the Son of God, again, we're for argument's sake, what do Christians believe, and then do we actually find that kind of uh, confirmation? Uh, if Jesus were the divine Son of God, we would expect him to make claims that only the divine Son of God should be making. And that's exactly what we find. Jesus claimed to be the final judge over all mankind. He claimed that he can forgive sins, and that when people sin, they owe a debt to him. Jesus said that he can answer the prayers of his followers. I don't know any mere prophet that can answer prayers. Jesus said that he is greater than the prophet Solomon, greater than the prophet Jonah, greater than the temple of God. He claimed to be Lord of the Sabbath and the Lord of the prophet David. And we find the same thing from uh, Jesus' followers. John the Baptist, who is considered uh, to be a prophet by both Christians and Muslims, said that he wasn't worthy of untying Jesus' shoes. So why is Jesus so different? Jesus' disciple John calls him God in the opening verses of his book. Uh, his disciple Thomas addresses him as my Lord and my God. His disciple Peter calls him our great God and Savior. The Apostle John, the Apostle Paul, and the writer of Hebrews unanimously declare that all things were created through Jesus. Now, why do we find these claims in the scriptures? This was the impression that Jesus left with his followers. And by the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, there were only two categories of people. There were people who were bowing down and worshiping him, as his followers did, the people who believed him. And... Those who rejected him were accusing him of blasphemy and saying, this man has to die. What did they agree on? They agreed that this man was saying things that no mere human being should ever say about himself. And that's exactly what we would expect to find if Jesus were the divine son of God and were making this known to his followers. Uh, next, if the Christian view were true, we would expect to find Jesus living as a servant and laying down his life for the sins of others. And that's exactly what we find Jesus claiming about himself. So Jesus said he uh, didn't, come to, uh, didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus says he is uh, living here among us as a servant, that's part of the incarnation, and uh, that he's going to lay his life down as a ransom. 
And so when does he do this? Well, at the crucifixion, uh, Jesus told his disciples in multiple ways on many occasions that he was going to be mocked and beaten and killed. You see this over and over again in the Gospels. Uh, he told them that his uh, death would be a guilt offering for the sins of the world, just as uh, we read in, we would uh, read in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. And things happened just as Jesus said they would. Interestingly, we opened the Quran to Surah 4, 157 to 158, and the Quran tells us that Jesus didn't die by crucifixion. Uh, he wasn't crucified at all. It was made to appear to people as if he were crucified. And the standard Muslim interpretation would be that God disguised someone, um, most commonly Judas, to make him look like Jesus. And what's, uh, what's interesting about this view is that if you think about it, how did all of us in here come to the view that Jesus died by crucifixion? Well, I mean, th those of you who are Christians, you believe that Jesus died on the cross. Where did you get that idea if the Muslim view were true? You got that idea from Allah, who tricked people into believing that Jesus died by crucifixion. And so, uh, one, of, one of the most interesting things about the Muslim view is that uh, at least this part of the Christian belief actually came from Allah when he tricked people into believing that Jesus died. And of course, as Christians, we, we, we can't take that seriously. Jesus predicted that he would die by crucifixion. All the evidence we have tells us that Jesus died by crucifixion, and this fits uh, perfectly with the Christian view. This is exactly what we would expect if the Christian view were true. What else do we have? Well, Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead as he claimed he would. He told his followers that he would rise from the dead. So if the Christian view were true, and Jesus, after dying, rose from the dead and appeared to his followers, what would we expect to find? Well, we would expect to find uh, evidence of appearances to his followers. And we know that Jesus' follower, of Jesus' uh, original 12 disciples, disciples, the one who betrayed him, uh, committed suicide. Uh, John lived out his life. But other than that, these men went to their horrible, bloody deaths, proclaiming that Jesus had appeared to them. And uh, that's, uh, that's the real reason I'm uh, a Christian today, is I couldn't imagine anyone uh, going to such a horrible, bloody death if they'd made something up. Now, true, people can die for, for a lie, but if you die for something, it means you believe it. Now, maybe you were tricked or something like that, but I know that if you're willing to lay down your life for something, you have to believe it. And so the question is, how do people come to arrive at their beliefs? Well, most of the time, when someone lays down their life for something, it's because they came to this view because of a message that someone else told them. So if you're raised as a Christian or raised as a Muslim or raised as something else, you might be willing to lay down your life for your beliefs. But how did you get those beliefs? You heard it from someone else and you really sincerely believed it. The difference between that and what happened to the apostles, the apostles were dying for something they claimed to have witnessed. And when I investigated Christianity, I started thinking about this very hard. What could have convinced all of these men? Maybe you get a wacko every once in a while. I'm going to make something up and I'm going to die for it. Uh, but all of them across the board willing to lay down their lives for this claim that they had seen Jesus risen from the dead had to uh, confront that because we know that's historically true. And we have to ask why there was this evidence. Well, Christianity gives us the answer. The reason these people all saw Jesus and were willing to lay down their lives for it was because they saw Jesus. There's no other explanation that fits the facts. And so, um, Jesus rises from the dead. If the Christian view is true, then we would expect Jesus, after his resurrection, to return to his glorious, glorified state that he had um, set aside in order to come into this world. And that's exactly what we find Jesus saying would happen in the Gospels. Uh, Jesus says, now, Father, glorify me. This is uh, shortly before his crucifixion. He says, now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So Jesus says he's about to die, and he asks the Father to give him back the glory that he had before the world began. Who has glory with the Father before 
the world existed. Well, certainly not a mere creation, a mere prophet. And so it's clear from the teachings of the Christian scriptures, the Gospels, that Jesus is making all kinds of claims uh, that he shouldn't be making if he's a mere prophet. But we find confirmation over and over again in the Christian scriptures of the Christian view. That's why we have these Christian views, because we find them uh, in the scriptures. So what's the alternative? It's clear what the Bible teaches. What's the alternative? If you want to reject what the Bible teaches, you have to say that the gospel message has been corrupted. And that's generally what Muslims will tell us. And I just, I just want to say, it, when you tell me that God's message and God's word has been corrupted, you're not just telling me something about something that happened historically. You're telling me something about God. You're telling me something about what God uh, can do. Because according to Christians and Muslims, God uh, sent Jesus in the world for a purpose. And Christians believe this, this purpose was fulfilled uh, perfectly. And if you're a Muslim, I'd say you have to believe uh, whatever Jesus did, it didn't last very long. It was corrupted partly by Allah, by deceiving people into believing that Jesus died on the cross. And you have to, you know, you have to think about this. And what's more, what's more interesting, I think, is that when we read the Quran, we find repeated confirmation of the scriptures of the Christians and the Jews. Interestingly, in the Quran, Muhammad himself was commanded to go to the Christians and Jews to find out if Islam lines up with their revelations. In Surah 1094, uh, Allah says to Muhammad, but if you are in doubt as to what we have revealed to you, ask those who read the book before you. Christians and Jews are called the people of the book. Ask those who read the book before you. Certainly the truth has come to you from your Lord, therefore you should not be of the disputers. So if Muhammad was commanded to come to the Christians and the Jews to see uh, does my message line up with yours? Obviously, Muslims today should ask us, uh, does our message, does the, the, the Muhammad's teachings line up with the message of Jesus according to the New Testament? And we'd have to say that the answer is no. And so when we examine uh, the first century evidence, we find constant, consistent confirmation of the Christian message, and we never find confirmation of the Islamic message. And so if we ask ourselves, what was the message of Jesus? We'd have to say that the divine Son of God entered our world to be the sacrifice for sins, that he rose from the dead, and that he returned to glory. And this is exactly what Christians believe. Thank you, David. Sammy, you now have 20 minutes to respond. Sound good? Yeah, all right. I'd first of all like to thank the pastor for allowing us to debate here on such short notice, as well as to David. We just set this up um, <clears throat> last week. Now, I know I'm debating in a church and I'm a Muslim, but I'd like to reassure everybody that I don't hate Jesus. Uh, I'm not here to attack him. Uh, I love Jesus. In fact, some people sometimes say I resemble Jesus, you know, those pictures. <laughs> so I'm not here to uh, bash or attack Jesus. In fact, it's a pillar of our faith to accept Jesus. No Muslim can be a Muslim without believing and accepting in Jesus. In fact, the Quran says that everybody before the day of resurrection will have to believe in Jesus if they want to be saved. So now according to Islam, what does it say about the uh, message of Jesus? What did he teach and uh, what did he say? Uh, David brought up a lot of points, we'll get into that in the rebuttals. And if, not, if I'm not able to address any of his points, then please ask it to me. Now according to Islam, the message of Jesus was pure monotheism. His ministry was all about teaching the Israelites who he was sent to about the true and one God. For example, in the third chapter, verse 51, it quotes Jesus telling his people about the monotheism of God. Worship God, my God, and your God, that's the straight path. And in chapter 5, verse 72, again, it talks about how Jesus preached the monotheism of God. That was his ministry. Now, I'm sure a lot of people will be asking, but wait a minute, weren't the Jews already monotheists? They have the first commandment, after all, so 
why would Jesus preach a message that they already believed in? You know, that doesn't make much sense. So we have to first of all define what monotheism actually is. Does monotheism simply mean believing in one God? If that was the case, then Satan would be a perfect monotheist as well, because he believes in one God. Monotheism is more than simply believing that there is one God. Monotheism includes the belief that there is one God, as well as the belief that this God is the only God worthy of worship. Now the second question, what does worship mean? Does worship simply mean praying to God? No, worship is much, it has a much wider meaning than simply meaning prayer. Worship includes following God's laws, His rules, His regulations, living your life according to how God wants you to live. That is all part of worship. So that comes, that comes to the main question. Were the specific Jews of Jesus' time, the people He came to call, the one, as he said, I came to call the sinners. Not everybody, I'm here for the sinners. Now, were the sinners who Jesus came to call, were they following this pure monotheism? Were they worshipping God as he should be worshipped? And the answer is a crystal clear no, they weren't. And you can just open up your Bibles and go to Mark chapter 7, verses 6 to 13. And this is what Jesus says to his people, the ones he was preaching to. He says, well has Isaiah prophesied about you, you hypocrites. So he calls them hypocrites. And then look what he says. You have laid aside the commandments of God for the traditions of men. So according to Jesus, his people laid aside the commandments of God for their own, main man, uh, for their own man-made traditions. And then he even says something even harsher. He says, you have rejected the commandment of God so that you can keep your own traditions. Notice how explicit he is. He's telling his people, you rejected the command of God. And if that wasn't harsh enough, in verse 13, he gets even more harsh when he says, you have made the word of God into no effect through your man-made tradition. So according to Jesus, these people have made the tradition, the commandments of God useless for their own man-made tradition. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like a people who are really following pure monotheism. That sounds like a people who are in dire need of a prophet to come and remind these people of the message about the pure monotheism of God and to lay aside their man-made traditions and replace it back again with the word and commandment of God. And in fact, if you read the Old Testament, God or Yahweh is very strict to the Israelites about following the commandments of God. If they don't do the commandments, if they don't follow His laws, there's a bunch of curses that are listed and so forth and so forth. And now Jesus is telling them, you have laid aside the commandment and made it useless. And so what did Jesus have to say? What else did he have to say? He taught his people to follow and teach the law. So remember the point I'm trying to make, that monotheism is not simply about worshipping or believing in one God. It's about worshipping him by following his rules and regulations, which Jesus condemned his people for not doing. Now if you open your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 15, verse 19... Jesus, again, he teaches his people that whoever teaches the law and follows the law, not just teach it. Today we hear a lot of people say that you just need to teach the law and listen to its good moral teachings. But Jesus says, teach the law and follow the law and you will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You'll be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus himself said he wasn't here to abolish the law. In that same reference, he says, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. Now, how do you fulfill a law? You fulfill a law, you fulfill a law by practicing it out. And in context, if you read the verse right after he says, I came to follow the law, he tells his people to follow the law and teach the law. And you shall be great in the kingdom of heaven. And now according to Jesus, how do people get saved? Again, you'll find a consistent pattern. If you open your Bibles, Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 21. 
Someone came to Jesus and asked him, how can I be saved? And Jesus says everything I'm just telling you. Jesus told the guy, you know the commandments? Jesus didn't just tell him, oh, you believe in one God, the first commandment. Jesus said, do you know or do you follow the commandments? Which is believing in one God, as well as actions, not simply having faith. And Jesus told him, do you follow the commandments? Do you follow this and that? And the guy said, yes. And Jesus just told him, you need to, you're on a good path. You just need to do one more thing. Give up your possessions for charity and follow me. And the guy couldn't do it. And Jesus was obviously trying to send a message to his people as well. To stop being so materialistic and to give up their possessions for the poor people. And Muslims have a similar version of that. Uh, the zakat. We pay a yearly charity tax. It's one of the five pillars of Islam where we give from our wealth to the poor. It's an obligation that Muslims must follow. Now on top of this, Jesus also preached about the kingdom of God. If you read the three Gospels, Mark, Luke and Matthew, you'll find that the theme of the kingdom of God is very heavy in these three Gospels. In Matthew chapter 9, Verse 35, Jesus said that he came to preach the gospel, or not the gospel, he came to preach the kingdom. He was going in the synagogues and around the area preaching the kingdom. In Luke chapter 4, verses 42 to 44, Jesus even says, I have been sent. My purpose for being here is to preach about the kingdom. And what does he want to do? He wants to call sinners to the kingdom. And how do you get there? By repentance. But now how do you repent? According to Jesus, as we saw, you repent by following and acting out on the law. For example, in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. This is the opening of the gospel. The opening message of Jesus. And he's going around telling people, the kingdom of God is at hand and repent. So this is the main message of Jesus, repent, the kingdom of God is here, is basically all about pure monotheism, because after all, you get into the kingdom by following pure monotheism. Now if that wasn't enough, in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 30, Jesus ends it all by saying the most important commandment, because he was asked, what is the most important commandment? And he answered, the most important commandment is, Hear, O Israel, our Lord God is one. Monotheism. And according to Jesus, that is his main message. And it's really that simple. That is the message of Jesus. Now I'm sure some people will be saying, but as David said, that Jesus came to die for our sins. That's his message. That... Um, there must be justice. You know, God has to punish sin. And according to Christianity, Jesus is that perfect sacrifice. The atoning sacrifice to get rid of all sin. Well, there's a big problem with that. Because, first of all, sins were already being forgiven before the crucifixion. That's a fact. Were people before the crucifixion all condemned to hell because there was no cross? Of course not. There was already a system in place for people to be forgiven. The baptism. Remember John the Baptist in Mark chapter 1. What was John the Baptist doing in the river? He was baptizing people for the remission of sins. To get rid of their sins. Ironically, Jesus got baptized as well. So there was already that method to get rid of sin. There was already a system in place. Another thing, even David mentioned it. I mean, Jesus forgave sin. So if Jesus could simply forgive sin, then why did he have to die? There was already a way to get rid of sin without the cross. You only need the cross if it's necessary, but sins are already being forgiven without the cross. Jesus just forgave the sin. Without punishment, without atonement, he just told the man, you are forgiven. And by the way, Jesus stated that he has the authority he was given the authority to forgive sin, not that he owned it. And in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 15, I'm sure Christians will know about this. Jesus taught his people how to pray. And in that prayer, you call on the Father to forgive you of your sins. In your prayer. And when Jesus taught this, this was before the crucifixion. 
And Jesus also told the people in their prayers, and you can read it all in the reference I gave you. Jesus taught his followers that if you forgive somebody in your prayer, God will forgive you. Notice how sin is removed. If you forgive somebody, you will be forgiven by God. And if you don't forgive somebody, God will not forgive you. No punishment, no sacrifice. Sin is being removed without a cross. So we're seeing a pattern here, as I said. Sins are getting removed without the cross. So the cross and sacrifice is not necessary. And then in Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, how will people be judged? You know, David talked about Jesus judging the people. Well, according to what shall they be judged? I'll read it for you. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to His works. You will be judged according to Jesus, the Son of Man, by your works, by your actions, not by the crucifixion or your faith in the cross. And Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 36, Jesus gives a longer explanation. He will come and He will separate the sheep. He will put them on the left and the right. And according to Jesus, the people who will be saved are the good people. The people who are good and the people who won't be saved are the bad people. Once again, there's no need for a cross. People will be forgiven based on how they are. Based on their actions. Not based on a sacrificial cross or a atoning sin. So... For me personally, I see that as a big problem for the crucifixion. You're telling me that the crucifixion is there to get rid of sin. But I'm telling you, according to the Bible, there was already a method in place to get rid of sin. So the sacrifice of the cross is not really needed. It's a bit inconsistent. But yet, everything I'm saying fits in a very simple pattern that all goes along quite easily. And it's easily reconciled with two thousand years of prophets and messengers coming before Jesus, such as Moses, all those other prophets. They didn't have uh, human sacrifices. They taught their people, you can be forgiven by God by repenting and so forth. So the sacrifice is not really needed. And what is true justice? Does the crucifixion actually get rid of sin? Is that true justice? When you think of it, it doesn't really get rid of sin because, for example, let's say I sin, according to the atonement um, doctrine, Jesus took that sin because I can't atone for myself. I'm a human. I'm not perfect. But that sin had to get removed. But I didn't pay for it. Jesus paid for it. So technically, the sin has never been paid for because the wrong person has been punished. It's like someone commits a crime... So instead of sending the actual person who committed the crime, you send somebody else in his place. That is not true justice at all. True justice is actually punishing the person who did it. And if that person truthfully repents and feels bad about what he did, then actually it is true justice and mercy to forgive him. Because he repented and he feels bad about what he did. After all, God is all loving, right? We all deserve second chances. God is not some uh, dictator who's just going to throw you out of his house because you fell down. God expects you to fall down. But what's important is that you pick yourself back up and go back to him in repentance. And he will open his arms and he will be all loving and all forgiving. That's what Islam teaches. According to Islam, God loves repentance. When you walk to him, he runs to you, according to Islam. Now for me personally, that's something beautiful. Because I know my all-powerful God, who's far greater than me. I'm so insignificant to Him. But yet He's there for me if I fall. He's not going to turn away from me. He's always going to be there when I need Him. And if I turn in repentance, I know He can forgive me and so forth. Now that right there is pure, beautiful spirituality, justice and repentance. Now if I don't repent... And if I still do my bad things, then according to Islam, God will punish you. According to Islam, we all have a record which is being recorded and we will be brought on judgment day. Even if you step on an ant, according to Islam, that ant will be brought before you on judgment day. So in Islam, there is a concept which 
with justice. You don't just get away with doing anything you feel like. You can't just go punch somebody in the face and say, oh, well, yeah, I'm going to repent and it's all good. There, it doesn't work like that. Just like how Christians say you can't just sin and believe in the sacrifice. The same with Islam. You can't just say, I'm going to do bad things and repent. It doesn't work like that. You can't play tricks on God. So you put this all together and to summarize the message of Jesus centered around monotheism and I don't believe it's centered around the sacrificial system because of all the problems I brought to you. In fact, I'll ask even David, there was a system in place before the crucifixion. So why is the crucifixion necessary if there was already a method in place to get rid of sin? You only need something if it's really needed. I mean, if you have a car that can take you to some place, then why do you all of a sudden need this spectacular car that comes 2,000 years later and all, it starts doing what the other car has been doing all along? Now, for me personally, that doesn't make sense. And on a final point, did Allah invent Christianity? Because according to David Wood, and he's right, um, Jesus, according to Christianity, was not the one placed on the cross. Somebody else was put on the cross. Who that was is speculation. Some say it was Judas. But is that the cause of Christianity? Because you were tricked into believing Jesus died? Not really. Because you as Christians, you don't simply believe that Jesus died on the cross. You believe He died for your sins and rose in three days. Amen. Now that is something completely different to simply believing a man died on a cross. There would be no problem if you believe Jesus died on a cross as a martyr. You wouldn't be condemned for that. But you don't simply believe in that. You believe that He died for your sins and He rose and that has nothing to do with Allah. He didn't tell you that. It was the Apostle Paul who mainly brought those teachings up. So no, uh, you are not Christians because of that incident. So that's the difference. You can simply believe that Jesus died as a martyr, like many other prophets. But obviously, um, you believe in more than that. So I'll basically end it on that. The message is that there is only one God, and only that one true God deserves worship. Not a man, uh, not a created being. Jesus worshiped God. And he fell on his head. And so what I'd like to say is we should all follow the God who Jesus worshipped. And the God who sent Jesus according to Jesus. As Jesus said, my God and your God. Coincidentally, the Quran says the same thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sammy. That concludes our round of opening statements. We will now move into our first round of rebuttals. David, you have 10 minutes. You can begin. Well, thank you, Sammy. I'm going to uh, jump right into the responses because we only have 10 minutes. Uh, for those of you who are new to the debate, if you see us criticizing each other's positions and so on, just keep in mind this is not an interfaith picnic. Uh, we, this, is both, this is what we do. Uh, we, we, we know we're going to be responding to each other's uh, points, and we're not, probably, not, probably not going to be uh, too gentle with it. Uh, and we're both fine with that. I know Sammy is. Uh, I'll just go ahead and respond to several of Sammy's points. He says the message of Jesus was pure monotheism and that Jesus came uh, to bring people back, to bring the Jews back to pure monotheism. I'll make uh, two points here. One, Jesus had a very strange way of going about this, of bringing people to pure Islamic monotheism. Uh, because he, go, he went around saying things like, uh, that he is the I am of the Exodus, that he had glory with the Father before the world began. Uh, he said in, in John, um, uh, he said in John, all things that the Father has are mine. Who can say that everything that belongs to God belongs to me? Uh, so these are the sorts of claims Jesus is making. He makes them throughout the Gospels and claims to be the final judge, claims to be the Lord of the Sabbath, claims to be the Lord of the prophet David. If he was trying to bring back people back to a pure Islam, Islamic monotheism, very strange way uh, to do that. And I would say, if you believe that's what Jesus came to do, Jesus failed miserably. Where are these first century Muslims? The followers of Jesus believed in the Trinity. Uh, the people who rejected him are guilty of rejecting one of God's greatest prophets. So. Everyone who came after Jesus is guilty. And if, so if he came uh, to 
make these people better, to make society better, he did a really, really bad job of it. Um, and uh, Sammy says that we, we get to the kingdom by following pure monotheism. How, how does that work? How do you, if you, but if you just believe in a, a certain doctrine, then you're going to get into the kingdom of heaven. There's something missing, and watch what happens. We'll get to it. Um, Sammy says that sins were forgiven before the crucifixion. And he, he issued this as a challenge, if sins are forgiven, uh, if there was already a system in place for forgiving sins, if Jesus said that he could forgive people their sins even before he was crucified, well, how can we say that the crucifixion is necessary? Well, according to the Bible, Jesus was the one who was to be slain from the foundation of the world. We find this, we, we find uh, predictions that, that this sacrifice was coming, that Jesus would be sacrificed for our sins, uh, in the Old Testament. And so you are forgiven. God can pronounce uh, forgiveness to you. Jesus can pronounce forgiveness uh, upon you. But at the end of the day, when you have to be forgiven, when the, you know, the scales are in place, your sin has to be paid for. And Jesus is the one who, according to the Bible, paid for all sins that have ever been forgiven. So uh, again, in Christianity, at the end of time, all sin has been punished. Uh, either the punishment was taken by Jesus, or you you pay the punishment, or you pay the uh, you pay that debt yourself. Either way, all sin has been punished. None of it gets swept under the rug. Um, Sammy says that we will be judged by our works. Yes, we, we agree that uh, that if you sin, you will be judged by your works. The Christian view is that when Jesus is the one who is substituted for you, uh, that that's, that, becomes, uh, that becomes your position, your position, your status before God. So, and by the way, Sammy says that, you know, this is what Christians say. No, this is what Jesus said. Jesus is the one who said that he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Sammy is quoting the New Testament left and right. Well, if those things were the only statements of Jesus in these documents, uh, he might have a point. But we have to reconcile these passages with other things Jesus said, and Jesus claimed that he was going to lay his life down as a ransom for many. Um, now, on this issue, which I think is, is massively important, this issue of uh, Jesus paying the price for sins, Sammy says, true justice is punishing the person who did it. And he compares this to if someone commits a crime, you punish... Uh, you, you go grab a random person and punish that person uh, for the person's crimes. Well, Christians don't believe God went out and picked some random person and said this person is going to uh, be the sacrifice for sins. But there is a religion that does teach that. There is a religion that teaches that God is going to take some random people and punish them for the sins of others. That religion is Islam. And lots of Muslims don't know this, but uh, that is the position of Muhammad. Muhammad said in Sahih Muslim, one of Islam's most trusted collections of a hadith, Muhammad said in Sahih Muslim 66, uh, 65, Allah's messenger said, when it will be the day of resurrection, Allah will deliver to every Muslim, a Jew or a Christian, and say, here is your rescue from hellfire. Uh, the next uh, hadith says, Allah's apostle said, no Muslim would die, but Allah would admit in his stead a Jew or a Christian in hellfire. And 6668 says, uh, Muhammad says there, will, there would come people amongst the Muslims on the day of resurrection with as heavy sins as a mountain, and Allah would forgive them, and he would place in their stead the Jews and the Christians. So think about this, because Muslims don't understand. They have a doctrine of substitutionary atonement. Yes, uh, Allah can forgive you, according to Islam. Uh, but in my opening statement, I said that Muslims will tell me that Allah can just sweep sins under the rug. He can let the sins go. According to Muhammad himself, those sins are going to be punished. The sins of Muslims, even if they're sins as heavy as a mountain, those sins are going to be punished. But they're going to be placed upon the Jews and Christians. So at the end of the day, there's no, different, there's no disagreement between me and Sammy's prophet Muhammad on whether the sin has to be paid for. We agree that it does. Uh, the difference is Sammy, Sammy's prophet believes that these sins will be put on the backs of Jews and Christians. Uh, we believe that Jesus voluntarily uh, took that debt upon himself. Now, Sammy believes that this is unjust. And 
just to give an example of why I don't believe this is unjust, because it, you know, on, on, at first glance, you say, hey, someone else is paying someone else's debt. That sounds weird. Uh, I'll give an example from the book of Philemon with the Apostle Paul. There was an escaped slave, a runaway slave named Onesimus. Onesimus ran away, and of course, this is going to be the death penalty, and he stole some merchandise in order to apparently fund his runaway. And the Apostle Paul wants to reconcile him uh, and end this kind of penalty against him. And the Apostle Paul sends a letter to Philemon, this uh, master, the slave master, and says, uh, whatever he owes you, I will pay it. Charge it to my account. So the Apostle Paul is saying, this guy cannot pay this price. I'm going to pay it for him. And he says, I want you to receive him as you would receive me. So think about this. He owes you a debt. I'm going to pay that debt. And I want you to think of him like you think of me, like you think you would think of the Apostle Paul. Now, who would look at that and say, oh, horrible. Oh, horrible. How horrible. How, how unjust. Why would that be unjust? See, I look at that and I say, that is the greatest thing anyone could ever do for another person, and we look at the Christian message and now multiply that by on a cosmic scale, on a cosmic scale of someone doing that uh, for sinners everywhere, and then you have the Christian message, and I wouldn't look at that and say, what a horrible message, I would say, uh, wow, what a beautiful message, that is good news. And finally, Sammy points out that even though, according to uh, Islam, God deceived people into believing that Jesus had been crucified when he hadn't, this didn't start the Christian message because uh, Christianity requires other beliefs. So in philosophy we say uh, the crucifixion is necessary for Christianity, but not sufficient. You need more than just the crucifixion. Um, but why is this important? Would anyone in here be a Christian if that deception hadn't taken place? If people didn't believe that Jesus died by crucifixion, could Christianity have ever gotten off the ground? And the answer is no. And if you want to blame the Apostle Paul for certain other teachings, let's say the resurrection of Jesus or the deity of Christ or the Trinity, or you want to blame people later, you have to agree that part of the Christian message was started by a deception of Allah. And if you're a Muslim, that should bother you. We're Christians in this room because Allah did such a great job tricking everyone that all the evidence favors Jesus' crucifixion, his, sacrif his sacrificial death by crucifixion. And so if that didn't happen, and we're only here because of what Allah did, now we've got a very interesting message on our hands. Uh, because Allah, whether knowingly or unknowingly, helped start a false religion, and so we have to regard Christianity, if we regard it as false, as the combined deception of Allah and someone like the Apostle Paul. And I don't see how you can regard Jesus as a failure and Allah and God as a deceiver and claim that you honor uh, God and his prophets. Thank you, David. Uh, Sammy. <laughs> you have 10 minutes. All right, uh, thank you for that. Uh, now, with the point, Jesus would be a failure if he's the Jesus of Islam, because where are the followers of Jesus? Where are all those pure monotheists? There's one standing on stage right now. And if David doesn't tell the audience that it wasn't until the third century that, not the Trinity, that Jesus was officially declared as a God. In the third century. Now why is that? Anyone who studies early Christianity, and this is an undisputed fact, all you have to do is just go into academics, will know that within the first 300 years, there were many Christians who believed that Jesus was not God. And they didn't believe in a trinity. In fact, there's thousands of them today, millions of them. Many Christians, I just randomly talk to a Christian and I tell them, do you believe Jesus is God? You know, we're Muslim, you're Christian. Sometimes we talk about Jesus. I say, yeah, I love Jesus. I believe he's a special man, a prophet, but he's not God. And they tell me, yeah, I believe the same thing. There are millions of Christians today who do not believe that Jesus is God. Now, maybe some of you will say they're not true Christians, etc. That's another topic, but the fact of the matter is these Christians do exist. And let's go into time of Jesus. 
Let's go to his right hand man, Peter. What did Peter say about Jesus? When Jesus asked him, Jesus said, who do you say I am? Who do you think I am, Peter? And in Mark chapter 8, verses 29 to 30, what does Peter say? He says, you are the Christ, the Messiah. He didn't say you are God, you are part of the Trinity, you are the divine son of God, etc., etc. That's his right hand man. What about the crowd when Jesus entered Jerusalem? The, the prophecy, you know, the Messiah would come into Jerusalem. How did the crowd welcome Jesus when he came on the donkey? Did they say, oh, our Lord and Savior, God, we've been waiting for you. You were prophesied in the Old Testament. Finally, God in the flesh is here with us. No, they said, Hosanna, the son of David, the king we have been waiting for is here. And they didn't mean God, the king, the Messiah, the prophet. What about the three wise men who came to Jesus when he was born? In Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. When those three wise men came to meet Jesus when he was a little baby, did they say, where is God? We're here to worship God. We're here to see the man who created us. They didn't. They said, where is the one who's the king of the Jews? Even in the Gospel of John, when in John chapter 6, verses 10 to 14, when Jesus fed a thousand, thousands of people, after he fed those thousands of people, did the people all bow and say, wow, this is God right here. Only God can do that. Instead, this is what they said. This is the truth. This is the prophet that we've been waiting to come into the world. And I can bring you so many other references in the Gospels where people did not believe that Jesus was God. In fact, you can even go read the book of James in your Bible. And many of the followers of James, the, Christa, the, the Jewish church as they call it, the church of Jerusalem, which was far more prominent before the church of Paul. And none of them believed that Jesus was God. And you can read the book of James for yourself, the brother of Jesus. So you have all of these uh, first century followers and even in the Gospels who did not believe that Jesus was God. And again, this is an undisputed fact. It wasn't until the third century that Jesus was officially declared as God, orthodoxy, not even the Trinity by then. So that's obviously a big problem if it took you 300 years to finally decide that. There's obviously more to it and it's not as simple as David is trying to make it out to be. Now, what about Jesus saying, uh, I am, and all things with the Father belong to me, and uh, I had the glory of the Father. Now, this is something very interesting. Why is it that all of these sayings are only in the Gospel of John and not in the other three Gospels? Now, as a non-biased person, if you have four supposed historical documents, and you have all of these big sayings in this last gospel, which some say came in early 2nd century, why is it all of these things missing in the earlier gospels? Can that be a coincidence? Now, if you're a non-biased person, and an, acad an academic, you would ask yourself that there's something obviously wrong with the fourth book. Because all of these teachings are missing from the first three books. Surely if Jesus said, I am, before Abraham, I am, the other three writers would have put it in there, wouldn't they? I mean, that's a massive saying. Not just one of them, not just two of them, all three of them have this saying missing. Now, and this is another undisputed fact, and this is not even a Muslim saying this. Most non-Muslim academics, most historians, not Muslims, even in America, all of them do not regard the Gospel of John as authentic historical documents on Jesus' life. Most academic scholars accept the fact that Jesus in the Gospel of John, rather than actual historical facts, is an interpretive theology. Now, you can disagree. That's fine. I, I don't expect you to believe me. But at the same time, you shouldn't expect me to believe it as well, because I have that strong evidence, unless you want me to discount all the historians. And David loves bringing historians. Christian apologetics love talking about historians. All historians accept that Jesus died on the cross. And most historians, actually all non-biased historians, do not regard the Gospel of John as authentic. You cannot have your cake and eat it. And again, back to the historians. Um, David says that uh, Allah is responsible for Christianity. No, he is not. 
Because there are many historians, David always talks about them, historians who believe that Jesus died, but they don't believe He rose from the dead. Now why is that? Because they don't believe in Paul. But if you believe in Paul, then you believe that Jesus died for your sins. Not because of Allah. So that point remains. One, and the Lord of the Sabbath. Now the Lord of the Sabbath, that term comes in the other three Gospels. But if you read the context of that passage, it actually says the Sabbath was made for men. So if you put it in context, the Sabbath is made for men, therefore the, the Son of Man is Lord over the Sabbath. That is a, lit, a legitimate interpretation. There are people who interpret this passage that when it says the Son of Man, it is not specifically referring to Jesus, but man in general. Because right before it, it says the Sabbath was made for you. You are, the Sabbath is made for you, so therefore we are the Lord of the Sabbath. Not that it makes us God. Now what about the uh, point about uh, the sacrifice was prophesied in the Old Testament? Really, so why was everyone uh, surprised when it happened? You know, David talked about uh, reconciling things. And according to David, the four Gospels talk about Jesus saying, I'm going to die for your sins. Well, if that's the case, why was everyone so shocked when it happened? If the Old Testament prophesied about it, if Jesus himself said it, did everyone suddenly get amnesia all of a sudden? And everyone forgot about it? There's something inconsistent here. If the Old Testament preached about the crucifixion and the sacrifice and rising in three days, then surely people would have expected it. Surely Jews of today would have all been Christians and they would have believed in Jesus. But why don't they? Because the Old Testament says nothing about the, the Jesus coming to die for your sins. Even in Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53 says nothing about a man rising in three days. And one of the websites David writes for, Answering Islam, even admitted that when I wrote it. And they said, I'm being desperate. But part of Christianity is not that Jesus just died for you, but that He rose from the dead. But this prophecy in Isaiah is missing the most important part of Christianity. According to Paul, without the resurrection, Christianity is all in vain. It's not just about dying, it's about rising. And Isaiah says nothing about a supposed resurrection. So there's a big problem. And once again, back to the historians. Not Muslims, but academic historians. What about all the sayings of Jesus when He said, I will die and rise in three days? Again, most historians do not consider those sayings to be actual authentic history. Because they don't even reconcile with the own text. They just randomly appear in there. They don't reconcile with the surprise and shock of the disciples. They don't recon reconcile with the Old Testament. They don't even reconcile with the very message of Jesus that I brought for you. Where He said, you will be rewarded by your actions. Sins were already being forgiven. Therefore, it wasn't needed. You take that out and everything fits together. And that's why most academic historians do not regard those things as, as historical. Now again, I agree, you don't have to believe me, you don't have to accept that, but similarly, I don't have to accept those sayings neither, because the strong evidence says that they're not really authentic. And there's more points that I'll get to afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we will begin with our second round of rebuttals. David, uh, you have 10 minutes for your rebuttal. Sammy uh, said, well, if, uh, that I asked where the pure monotheists are, if Jesus came to bring, restore pure monotheism, where are they? And he said, well, there's one on stage, apparently referring to himself. Uh, but why is Sammy this pure Islamic monotheist? Because of the teachings of Jesus? No, you'd have to say because of the teachings of Muhammad. So Jesus, again, failed, according to Islam. You can say he preached his heart out, but we have no record of any early Muslim followers of Jesus. Again, at the end of Jesus' uh, life on earth, there were two categories of people, those who were bowing down and worshiping him, and those who were condemning him for blasphemy. There was no one saying, hey, this guy is just claiming to be a prophet. 
Um, Sammy, so there are many Christians who don't believe Jesus is God. Uh, well, if you don't believe Jesus is God, you have to reject uh, the teachings of Scripture. And if Sammy wants to say, well, there are people who say they believe in Jesus, and yet they don't believe uh, he's divine, uh, we have to be consistent here. If you're going to say that, I can point out all kinds of followers of Muhammad who believe in Muhammad who don't believe Muhammad is the last prophet. They're called Ahmadis. Now, do Muslims believe that these Ahmadis are true followers of Muhammad? No, they say, look, these Ahmadis are rejecting Muhammad's claim to be the last and final prophet, and therefore, they're not true Muslims. Well, why wouldn't the same apply to Jesus? Sammy quotes Mark 8.29 to show that Peter didn't believe Jesus is God. Um, I just want to point this out, because watch what happens if we start reading this passage. Uh, and he continued by questioning him, but who do you say that I am? This is, um, uh, Jesus says, but who do you say I am? Peter answered and said to him, you're the Christ. And he warned them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. How do you quote... How do you quote Mark 8.29 and ignore Mark 8.31, where Jesus says he's going to be killed and he's going to rise from the dead? It seems uh, inconsistent. And if you want to go with the Gospels, you can't cherry pick. We believe Jesus is the Christ. Peter said Jesus is the Christ. Right. We believe that. We believe that Jesus is the Christ. But according to the New Testament, the Christ is the son of the living God. So what is that? You have he's the Messiah, and he's the Messiah because he is the one qualified to be the Messiah because of his uh, divine nature. Sammy says, well, did the wise men say that Jesus was God? Uh, if you recall, the wise men bowed down and worshipped Jesus. But regardless of them bowing down and worshipping Jesus, which they shouldn't be doing if Jesus is just a, just a mere human, uh, we're not claiming that everyone who saw Jesus understood uh, his true nature. Most people didn't. It wasn't until uh, the sayings of Jesus were vindicated by his resurrection, people started to understand some of these claims. Some people understood the claims uh, and worshipped him during his earthly ministry. Notice that Jesus didn't say, hey, stop, what are you doing worshipping me? I'm just a mere human being. Uh, Jesus accepted worship, uh, which he shouldn't be doing if he's a mere prophet. Sammy says Jesus wasn't declared to be God until the third century. Now, I know Sammy was complaining about the book of John, but I challenge Sammy to show me a scholar anywhere on the planet, any, any background, I don't care, who says that the book of John came in the third century. Uh, we have right here in the opening of John, since Sammy says that Jesus wasn't declared to be God until centuries later, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And who's this talking about? It says that all things were created through this word. And we go down to verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Read the passage in context. This is talking about Jesus. So you can say you reject what we read in the New Testament. You can say uh, we, you reject the teachings in the epistles where Jesus is called our great God and Savior. But you can't say no one called Jesus God until the third century. No one would ever say that. The New Testament is filled with claims that Jesus is God. So they certainly don't come from the third century. Um, and so addressing this claim that Sammy says that uh, claims about Jesus' deity only come in the book of John, this, this is simply false. There are certainly, uh, John certainly placed an important emphasis on this because of the theological issues he was dealing with that, at that time. But you find in, uh, in, the, in the other gospels, Jesus claiming uh, to be the final judge of all mankind, claiming that he's the one who decides who goes to heaven and hell. What mere prophet says, I'm the one who decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Uh, you find Jesus saying that he's the Lord of King David. You find Jesus saying that no one knows the Father except him, and you can only know the Father if Jesus is the one who reveals him to you. So Jesus is making all these claims. Again, this is not what we would expect a prophet to say. Um, Sammy says that the I am statements occur where Jesus uses this title of himself. Uh, these I am statements occur only in John. This is simply false. And let's go to the earliest gospel, which is the gospel of Mark uh, 650. Uh, For they all saw him and were terrified, but immediately he spoke with them and said to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. That's how it's translated. Uh, but in the Greek, it actually says, Take courage, I am, 
do not be afraid. We have the I am statements even in the synoptics. They're not always translated properly, uh, but that is what the text says. Sammy points out that uh, Jesus claiming to be the Lord of the Sabbath uh, isn't really a claim to deity uh, because the passage says that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, and maybe, uh, you know, the Son of Man there isn't even referring to Jesus. If you read the passage in context, Jesus is justifying what he's doing and his justification for what he could do on the Sabbath that other people could not do on the Sabbath was that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. And so this is obviously referring to Jesus, the justification for his actions. Sammy says that Isaiah 53 uh, isn't talking about Jesus. Maybe we'll uh, read uh, very briefly um, some of Isaiah chapter 53. Um, it's very interesting. You can read this passage. Uh, to just about anyone, start reading the passage and say, who's this talking about, whether it's a Christian or non-Christian, uh, and you start seeing some very interesting things. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And you can keep reading this passage over and, I mean, over and over and over again, someone dying for the sins of the world. If it's not Jesus, who is it? Um, Sammy said, well, if, if it was prophesied in Isaiah 53, and if Jesus made claims, that he was going to die, why were people surprised? Uh, well, if you, if, if, you, um, if you understand the doctrines of the first century, um, they believed that the Messiah was going to come, was going to conquer the Romans, establish the rule of Israel over the earth. So when Jesus claims to be the Messiah, uh, they understand that he's going to conquer, and that's why his disciples, uh, you could tell, were really convinced that he was going to crush the Romans. And, uh, so this is what they're expecting, and obviously when Jesus is making these claims about dying, they're thinking he must, be, he must be using some kind of weird language because he's the Messiah. He's the one who's going to uh, crush our enemies. And they did eventually find out that he uh, was speaking literally when he talked about his crucifixion. Sammy says, uh, most scholars don't accept Jesus' claims to death and resurrection as historical. So they look at Jesus saying he's going to die on the cross and rise from the dead, and they say that's not historical. And he says that's because it's not in the Old Testament and things like that. Nonsense. Um, first of all, uh, certainly Christian scholars take those seriously. Who, is, who are the scholars Sammy is referring to who don't take those as historical? Well, if you're an atheist or an agnostic scholar, you don't believe in predictive prophecy. You don't believe that someone can predict the future. And so if you open your Bible and see Jesus saying, I'm going to die and rise again from the dead, you don't believe that. You don't believe he said that. Not because uh, of any kind of historical investigation, but because you have an anti-supernatural bias. I only have a few seconds left, but Sammy is still saying that Allah is not responsible for starting Christianity. Uh, I acknowledge that Allah's deception by deceiving people into believing Jesus died by crucifixion is not sufficient for Christianity. You need more than that. But it is necessary. Christianity could not have started. And I'll just ask Sammy, why? Why did Allah trick the people of Jesus' time into believing he died by crucifixion? Doesn't Allah know the future? If he does know the future, doesn't he know that he's about to take part in starting the largest false religion in history. Doesn't he know that? And if he does know that, why would he do it? Why? There's no point to it in Islam. There's no point to the deception. He ended up destroying Jesus' work by helping start Christianity, which according to Sammy is simply false and had to be restored later by Muhammad. Doesn't make sense. Jesus is a failure and Allah is a deceiver. Thank you, David. Now, Sammy, you have 10 minutes for your rebuttal. All right, thank you for that. Um, now, first of all, I never said nobody believed that Jesus was God in the first three centuries. What I said was that it wasn't officially orthodoxy until the third century. That is an undisputed fact. It's not until the Council of Nicaea that it became official 
orthodoxy and what contradicted that is heresy. So why did it take you 300 years? Now that's a much bigger problem for David Wood than it is for me to find first century Muslims. And I brought you the text, so I don't need to repeat myself in bringing those two texts. David keeps saying there's two categories of people. People who believed he was God or blasphemy. I'm sorry, that's just 100% false. No academic believes that, and that's just a historical fact. There are third early century Christians who did not believe Jesus was God. I showed them in the Gospels, and it's also a historical fact if anybody studies uh, Christian history. Now again, why am I a monotheist? Because of Islam, not because of what Jesus taught. So therefore Jesus is a failure. Not really, because Islam preserved the message of Jesus. It continued his message. So therefore he's not a failure. Thanks to Islam, there are 1.5 billion more people now who believe in Jesus. If it wasn't for Islam, you'd still have those 1.5 billion people who wouldn't believe in Jesus. But thanks to Islam, you have people who believe in Jesus all the way in um, Indonesia, all the way in Pakistan, India, etc. Places where they didn't have majority populations who believed in Jesus. In fact, Mecca, which is where Islam started with the Prophet Muhammad, they were pagans, you know? And thanks to Islam, they became monotheists who believed in who? Jesus. Thanks to Islam, the entire Middle East virtually believes in Jesus, whereas before they were pagans. So I don't see how that's a bad thing. That's a great thing for Jesus. Now, again, the point in Mark, Jesus asked Peter, who do you say I am? He said, uh, you're the Christ, so that point's not disputed. Peter did not say you are God. That point remains. But what about the second part, where then Jesus supposedly, supposedly said, I will rise and die in three days. The, that's not Jesus actually speaking. That's the author's remark saying that Jesus supposedly said that. And secondly, it's not being inconsistent at all. Because as I said, they don't reconcile with each other. If Jesus clearly taught that I will die and rise in three days, if he clearly said those things as Mark tells us, then why were they all surprised? If you tell me that in two days you're going to go to Jerusalem, you're going to die, and all these things are going to happen, and the Old Testament supposedly prophesizes it, I have all this evidence, and then it all happens as you say it happens, and then I'm shocked and I'm sad. Sorry, something doesn't make sense at all. There is no reconciliation between the two. And again, how can you quote one part of the gospel but reject that other part? That's what historians do, and no one calls them inconsistent. There's a historical method. It's academia. Many historians quote a certain part of the gospel, and they quote the same chapter, they'll quote the same incident, but they'll reject what really happened, what they'll come up with the historical method. So it's not being inconsistent. And the reason why I'm rejecting it is because it doesn't reconcile. It doesn't fit. And David even brought up Isaiah 53, and I, I was smiling because David says, the disciples believe the Messiah would come and be a king. Why do they believe all of these things, but they don't believe the part where he's going to die? Why, why did they expect him to come and be a king, but they weren't expecting him to die if the Old Testament said it was going to happen? I mean, it's very simple, my point. Yeah. All right, the microphone's angry. But, uh, so my point is very simple. Like, as David said, they're expecting all these things. But shouldn't they also have expected that he would have died and rise and then come back later in the clouds if the Old Testament prophesied that? Yes, they would, but they don't. Now, why don't they? Because it never taught that. That makes perfect sense. Now, about the Lord of the Sabbath... Jesus was justifying what he could do on the Sabbath. Wrong, because Jesus never broke the Sabbath. What he was doing was not against the Sabbath. He even defended himself by bringing up David. Jesus never broke the Sabbath. Those were inter-Jewish debates. Once again, most scholars, I'd recommend you read E.P. Sanders' book. He has great information on this. And Jesus, again, did not break the Sabbath when he was doing what he was doing. And Jesus, if you read it in context, he even says, the Sabbath was made for us. And then he says, man, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. 
So that response by David doesn't work because he didn't break the Sabbath. And Jesus is the Lord of David. He is because he's the Messiah. He's the king. He's the leader. But that doesn't mean he's God. And the term Lord does not make you God. And David says um, Jesus is the final judge in the Gospels. Well, what did Jesus say? Is he actually the judge? According to Jesus, his disciples will also judge. So if you want to be consistent, if Jesus is God because he judges, his disciples are also God because they will sit on 12 thrones. But who's the 12th throne? Because Judas was killed. That's another point for another day. But as Jesus said, who gave him the authority to judge? Daniel 7 tells us the Son of Man was given authority. He was given dominion. He was given the power to execute that. That's what the Jews believed. That the Messiah would be a great man, a great leader, a very powerful man, a servant of God. Who would be working for God on God's behalf. And God was the one who gave him the authority. Once again, we have to look at it in context. And the point about John 1.1. 1, 1, again, if Jesus was in the beginning, and the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and it was God. Now, I've already responded to that. I've given my own responses to that, but I don't need to, because I'm using the simple method now. If that is true, where did Jesus ever say that? Because that's the author of John speaking, which some scholars say came in the early 2nd century, the last gospel, when theology was already forming. Where is this saying in Mark, Matthew, and Luke? Now that's a big problem. You have this big saying. This is a major thing to say. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was this, and the Word was that. Why does the other three Gospels simply fail to mention that? That can't simply be a coincidence. And what about Jesus saying, I am, in the Gospels? You know, when they were on the boat, and there was a storm, and Jesus was on the sea, and His disciples got scared. If you read it in context, His disciples thought He was a ghost. They thought he was a spirit. And so they were so scared. And then Jesus told them, don't be afraid, it's me, I am. That's the context. He was telling me, it's me, I'm not a ghost, calm down. And then they calm down. It doesn't mean I am, I am, like uh, he's God. And I think, um, I'm looking for more points. And people started to understand Jesus after he rose from the dead. That doesn't make sense. If the Old Testament prophesied all of these things, they would have been expecting it, not the other way around. And I keep repeating that point. And again, did people really understand Jesus after he died? Not really, because it wasn't until the third century that they officially declared him being God as doctrine. Not even Trinity was officially declared by them. So that response doesn't work. Now what about the scholars I'm quoting? I'm only quoting atheist scholars or atheist academics. Not really. Many Christian scholars believe in what I'm saying. I've read their books, and, but they'd be called liberal Christians. But nonetheless, they are Christians. And what matters is that they're not Muslims. That's the main point. That shows I'm being a bit consistent, that these guys are saying all these things. And I'm not going to my sources. Now, if I told you a Muslim said that, obviously you would reject it. But I'm going to a middle source, someone who's not a Muslim, and some of them are not Christians, some of them are Christians, and they're bringing all of these points which back the reason why I don't believe in what he is saying. Now, again, I'll repeat. It's, you're right, you don't have to accept what I'm saying. But at the same time, I have my evidence to not accept those reasonings. I have the academia, the non-Muslim scholars, and again, it's all about reconciliation, as David says. The points I'm making all reconcile with one another. Jesus taught pure monotheism. He taught his people how to be saved by actions. They were already being forgiven before he died. So you had the system in place, which all makes sense, and it all fits together. Thank you. Thank you, Sammy. And that concludes our round of rebuttals. We will now move into a 10-minute section of Crossfire. The Crossfire will proceed as follows.
Five minutes will be allotted to each debater. Uh, one minute per session. We'll start off with David, one minute, and then Sammy will have one minute to respond, and so forth. And each debater will have five uh, minutes in total. So gentlemen, no offense if I cut you off. We're gonna try to stick as close to one minute as possible, so it's not personal, just laying down the law. <laughs> you ready? Okay, go for it. All right, so I only have a minute. I wanted to address some matters of consistency uh, very quickly. Uh, you say, well, if Jesus was going to die on the cross and rise from the dead, then his disciples would have understood his comments this way and they would have been expecting this. Now, let's apply this reasoning to the Muslim view that Allah tricked people into believing that Jesus died on the cross and that the, the belief in Jesus' uh, crucifixion was Allah's deception. Can you show me some Old Testament prophecies and some beliefs uh, and predictions of Jesus that, uh, that would have led Jesus' followers to believe this, because that's the criterion that Sammy is using here. Uh, if this were true, they would have expected that. Well, if Sammy's view were true, then they would have expected uh, this deception of Allah. And also, if we are to reject the Gospel of John, because it's later than the other Gospels and shows differences, uh, how can we believe the Quran, which is five centuries later than all of these Gospels? Thank you, David. All right, really Same. quick. It's not just because it's late, but if you have something that comes late and is much different than the first three, that tells you that it's really inconsistent. But if you have a late document that is consistent with earlier documents, then obviously it's okay. Now, as for the first point, I never said those points were prophesied in Islam. You, on the other hand, say that that's prophesied in the Old Testament. Big difference. So you're making the claim that the Old Testament says all of, the, all of those things, but Obviously, I've been asking for you to show me where it clearly says it, and I'll bring it right back to you. If, as you say, the Old Testament predicts that the Messiah will come and die and rise in three days, why was nobody expecting it? Why were they surprised? And why were they still surprised when it happened? And why were they still surprised when he himself told them it was going to happen? Did they just all of a sudden forget? That's Thank you, Sammy. All right. Yes. Sammy, you say uh, it, it's not because the Gospel of John comes later, it's because it's inconsistent with the earlier sources. Uh, I disagree. I quoted several passages from the Synoptic Gospels that don't make sense if Jesus is some mere prophet. So this is perfectly in line with the teachings of Jesus. But here again is the Quran, which comes centuries later, inconsistent with the earliest Gospels. Yes, these earliest Gospels say that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died on the cross for sins, that He rose from the dead. This is utterly inconsistent with Islam. And so according to Sammy's, Sammy's standard, not according to mine, according to Sammy's methodology, we now have to reject the Quran and Islam. He says, I'm making the claim, I'm making the claim about Old Testament prophecy. Well, if you look at the Old Testament prophecy, someone's going to die for sins. If it's not Jesus, who is it? That's what it says. If people understand it or not, that's still what it says. Then you have Jesus saying he's going to die for sins, and then he dies. Put it all together. Thank you, David. Sammy? All right. We put it all together. But why didn't they put it all together and believe it? Why were they surprised? That, uh, it's the same question again. That's the point I'm making. Put it all together. Jesus did all these things, supposedly. The Old Testament supposedly said, someone will die. So now it's not the Messiah will die, now it's someone will die. And this someone comes, and he dies, and Jesus says all these things explicitly. And I'll ask you again, why were they surprised? Why weren't they expecting it? If the Old Testament said, I'll, I'll even grant you the argument, all right? The Old Testament says it, it's there. But why doesn't anyone believe it? Why were they surprised? Even when the Old Testament said it, even when Jesus said it, even when it happened, why were they sad? Even in the Gospel of Luke, when the disciples are walking and they meet Jesus, they don't know who Jesus is. They told this man that they're sad because they expected Jesus to conquer the enemies, etc., etc. So why were, why were they sad? Why weren't they expecting you, all these things? So, uh, listen to Sammy's standard. If someone doesn't understand it, then it's not true and it didn't happen. Um, he certainly doesn't apply this to Islam. But what, what do you have? Even if you want to sit there all day long and say, I don't get why people didn't understand this. 
Someone's going to die for our sins. If it's not Jesus, who is it? I'm asking, who is it who's going to die for our sins? Who's going to be pierced for our transgressions? We know why they didn't understand it. They were convinced that the Messiah, which they didn't necessarily believe was this suffering servant of Isaiah 53, is going to conquer. If Jesus is going to conquer, obviously he's not going to die for the sins, and that would have to be someone else. And what they didn't understand is that... Uh, the one who is the Messiah, who would, would be the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. If Sammy's just going to say they didn't get it, well, guess what? They eventually got it, and they eventually went around preaching that message to their bloody deaths. They did come to understand it. Thank you, David. All right, I'm not saying why didn't everyone believe it. I'm being specific. I'm specifically with the disciples, because even the gospel says he clearly told them in secret. So not general people, the specific people, and even his mother. He told them all of these things clearly. He didn't speak in parables to them. He told them clearly. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody tells me, I'm going to go to this town, I'm going to die, and it all happens as he says it happens, and then he rises, as he said it's going to happen, I'm not going to be shocked anymore because it's happened crystal clearly. And then I even have the Old Testament to back me up in my interpretation. But none of that happened. They were all surprised when he died. And you still haven't clearly answered. You just said they don't get it. But you're also telling us that it was all clear. It was so clear. So why didn't they get it? How can you get it now? But then at the time, they didn't get it. That's very inconsistent. Thank you, Sammy. Not inconsistent at all. If you, have, if you tell a first century Jew that you are the Messiah, and then you say at some point, you're going to die. The first century Jew is thinking, uh, you have to be speaking figuratively when you say you're going to die. That must mean something else. Why did the disciples change their mind? Let's explore the two explanations of Christianity and Islam. Why did Jesus' disciples come to believe that he died on the cross, according to Christianity? Because he died on the cross. It was a public event. It was a public execution. So when he said, I'm going to die for sins, and they say, we don't know what you're talking about because you said you're the Messiah, you're supposed to conquer. And then they see it actually happen. Oh, wait, he's not just the Messiah. He's also the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. What's the Muslim explanation for their change of heart? Well, they didn't believe Jesus was going to die, but then Allah tricked them into believing that Jesus died. And then they came to believe that he died for sins. Interesting. Thank you, David. All right, so now I'll just ask the question then. Are you saying then the Old Testament does not specifically say the Messiah will die? Are you saying now that the Old Testament says that this man will die? Is there a difference? Because I've been told by many Christians that the Old Testament says the Messiah will die and rise in three days. So if you could clarify that. And also with Isaiah 53 about the prophecy. Does Isaiah 53 say anything about a resurrection? Will the suffering servant rise in three days? Because as we all know, uh, Paul said that the resurrection is the central tenet of Christianity, not just the crucifixion. So does the Old Testament say the Messiah will die? And does Isaiah 53 say the, Mes the suffering servant will rise in three days? Thank you, Sammy. Uh, well, I was referring to Isaiah 53. There are certainly other prophecies in the Old Testament that Christians would regard as messianic and talking about, uh, talking about Jesus' crucifixion. I was focusing on Isaiah 53. You ask if it refers to the resurrection. Well, the suffering servant dies in Isaiah 53. Keep in mind, Jesus said he did not come to, uh, to be served, but to serve. He is the servant. And then... Uh, we see, you, you brought this challenge up from Isaiah 53, uh, starting in verse 11, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. So if he's going to be allotted a portion with the great, he's still alive. He was dead. That's a resurrection. Thank you, David. No, that doesn't have to be a resurrection. That can be a dying martyr being rewarded in the afterlife. I mean, again, so basically, I'm not going to ask you again, but basically... You just agreed that it doesn't specifically say that he will die and rise in three days. 
as, you, as it's supposed to say. So now if it's not that clear, if Isaiah is not saying he's going to die and rise in three days, as you believe, why should someone like me all of a sudden believe it? When you're obviously putting a very high interpretive Christian message to that, saying now that since he'll be alive later, that means he'll resurrect after three days, when they're two very different things. And again, back to the disciples, they themselves didn't see that prophecy the way you say it. So don't you think that's a, a big problem? Thank you, Sam. That concludes our crossfire section. That was exciting, wasn't it? Yeah. Some of you guys are going to have trouble sleeping from the adrenaline rush. <laughs> Uh, with that, we will uh, conclude the formal part of the debate. We'll take a two-minute break and then uh, come back for our Q&A session. Wait, we're at conclusions, right? Conclusions. After? Before? You want to do the conclusions now? Or Whatever you want. You're cool. We can do it at the end? At the end? After Q&A? Okay, that's fine. Okay. session. So for the question and answer session, what we have is a mic up in the front with Pastor McGee. And if you'd like to ask a question, we'd ask you to form a line down the center aisle. Uh, keep your question to under 60 seconds. Uh, address who the question is for. Each uh, debater will have two minutes to respond to the question. Um, my question is for Sammy. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm a former Muslim uh, apostate from Islam, who, uh, and I was uh, saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to ask you about your argument. You said during your debate that the message of Jesus was tawhid, it was monotheism. And not just monotheism, that it was monotheism in worship. And that you went on to say that that also includes following Allah or God's laws. That's correct. And one of the proofs you use from the Bible was chapter 5. 
where Jesus said in verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Um, for some reason, I don't think you've read the whole entire chapter. If you go down further in verse 20, Jesus also says, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Later on, he says down in verse 27, you have heard that it is said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say unto you, into you that everyone who looks upon a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. We know from Muhammad's history that he desires Zainab, the adopted son's wife, his adopted son's wife. He, had, he desired her to the point where he said that an angel came down and told him that Allah said, why did you conceal this in your heart? And Allah changed, well he says that Allah told him he could change the laws to allow him to marry Zainab. In another narration, we also know that while he was sitting with his companions, he saw a woman and became so sexually excited that he had to go to one of his wives and have sex with her. According to your criteria, has it Muhammad not followed the monotheistic message of Jesus? And has he not also violated this by committing adultery in his heart? And certainly he has not exceeded the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Thank you. Uh, Sammy, but, but before you start, he gave you a ton uh, of stuff, and we had two minutes. I don't think it's enough to respond, so I'd be happy in this situation, since you, he gave you a lot of material, if you want to take like three or four minutes, uh, I'd be happy with that, and I'll just stick with my two, because he hit you with a, a lot of stuff there. All right, thanks for the question. Now, the main points you brought up also affirm my point. Jesus told the people that your righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees, and you must follow the law. So at least those points I made remain. Now, as for the point about looking uh, lustfully at the lady, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, married the lady. He didn't go have a fornication with her or adultery. So that wouldn't be breaking any law. And secondly, as a Muslim, you also know, you were supposedly a Muslim, you know that the fiqh and the sharia of each prophet is different than another prophet. For example, the sharia of Moses didn't teach, if you look at a lady lustfully, you would be committing adultery. Jesus didn't break that law, he made it more strict, as E.P. Sanders would explain. So now it's not that if you commit adultery, if you look at her lustfully, that would be bad. So Jesus simply made it more strict according to his sharia. So each prophet would have a different sharia, basically a different law, but the message was the same. So some aspects might be a bit different. For example, Moses allowed divorce, Jesus was strictly against it unless there was adultery being there so the prophet didn't break the rules and again he got married to the lady and as for the second point you say the prophet uh, lusted and then went and made love to his wife what would you prefer for him to make love to that lady or to his wife lawfully so that point is not a point at all and i don't see how that's a bad thing you know sexual lust between a man and his uh, his wife is a very good thing, you know, Muslims are not shy about that. We are not an anti-sexual religion. In fact, that should be a good thing for most Muslim men and wives to be sexually active in the room. That's actually part of the Sharia as well, to please your wife sexually. And there's no shame in saying that. That would be my point. Thank you, Sammy. Uh, David, you have two minutes to respond if you want. Well, I have to agree that there is, um, well, several problems here uh, with, uh, for Sammy said that this is, uh, this is Jesus, the Sharia of Jesus. And notice the standards um, Jesus lays down um, that if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Now, Sammy said that Muhammad did, Muhammad uh, married Zainab, right? He married her after he lusted after her and his uh, adopted son, Zayd, divorced her because he found out Muhammad was lusting after her. And then Muhammad married the divorced wife of his own adopted son. So Sammy says, well, yeah, but he married her. True, he married her, but it was because he lusted after, thus violating the command of, of Jesus here, lusting after her in his heart, thus committing adultery. And I'm not sure how you would consider uh, marrying the wife of your own adopted son, which he divorced in order to please you, uh, as some vindication of Muhammad's uh, good nature. Thank you, David. We can take our next question. Uh, 
Um, you said I had 60 seconds, so I'm going to do two short questions. Um, this is for Sammy. Um, the first question is, you said that it is not just for God to place someone's sins on someone else, Jesus specifically. Um, yet, he quoted several times where it would say that the sins would be placed on a Jew or a Christian. How do you reconcile the two? And um, about your point that there was no official doctrine um, before the Council of Nicaea, what doctrine was official? Wasn't that the place where everything kind of started to become official? Was there any doctrine before the Council of Nicaea that was official? Yeah, there were no official doctrines before the Council of Nicaea. That's the point until the third century when the Trin not the Trinity, when Jesus and the Father were declared God became official. Now, if it's all clear in the Bible, why did they need to wait like three centuries till it became official? Now, as for the first point, the Hadiths don't say that your sins are being put on a Christian or a Jew or that he's atoning for your sacrifice. And secondly, no Islamic scholar has ever interpreted that way. Basically, we all believe in hell as theists. Now, people have positions in hell. A Muslim could literally go to hell. But he does actions and beliefs that get him out of hell. So instead of him, that place has been taken by a non-believer. Not that that believer replaced him, but that place that would have been with the Muslim has been taken by someone else who the Muslim would have been there, but the Muslim, because of his actions, got saved and so forth. Not that the other person took his sin or atoned for his sin like Jesus did on the sacrifice where if I'm a bad person and then I sincerely repent to Jesus, that sin goes to Jesus, so I'm saved. In Islam, that, that text and no scholar says that if you sin and you repent, that sin of yours will go to that Christian that he atones for it. And that's a, not my opinion. And my friends have written articles about it. If any of you visit my website, I'll even put a reference for it so you can read it in more detail. Yeah. Thank you, Sammy. David? Uh, you, you made an important point. I wanted to make it, but I never got to it, that Sammy is defining Christian orthodoxy as what was declared by the Christian councils. And he says, well, the first council that where all Christian leaders from across the Roman Empire could get together was the Council of Nicaea. Well, yeah, that was the first one they could get together. Before them, Christians are being persecuted and thrown to lions. They can't get together for a big council. So Sammy says, well, since the first big council happened 325, that's when orthodoxy was defined. No, they got together to discuss some issues, but orthodoxy was the Bible, and we have in the Bible very clear statements that Jesus is the divine Son of God, that he is uh, God in uh, in that God entered into this world. Now, Sammy says that the Hadith don't say that someone else is going to be punished for our sins. I, I quoted several passages. I'll quote one more. This is from uh, a Sahi narration from 110 Hadith Qudsi. Allah's Messenger said, On the day of resurrection, my Ummah will be gathered into three groups. One sort will enter paradise without rendering an account of their deeds. Another sort will be reckoned an easy account and admitted into paradise. Yet another sort will come bearing on their backs heaps of sins like great mountains. Allah will ask the angels, though he knows best about them, who are these people? They will reply, they're humble slaves of yours. He will say, unload the sins from them and put the same over the Jews and Christians. Then let the humble slaves get into paradise by virtue of my mercy. The angels under the command of Allah pick the sins off the backs of the Muslims, put them on the Jews and Christians. I don't know how Allah can say it any more clearly than that. Thank you, David. Next question. Oh, for David. Sound like you're saying. Um, uh, David. I like you, you're smiling a lot. Oh, thanks, thanks. <laughs> this is my first time. I watch you a lot, both of you. Um, first, my first question is, because uh, we're on this whole subject of, of salvation. Um, since I've been, I've been talking with Christians for like three years, and some questions I've gotten answered, some questions always avoided. But uh, in terms of um, the chapter of is, is the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, mm -hmm. where it says, um, the, the, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, nor, nor shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon them, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon them. This is basically saying, you know, uh, no one, a, a blameless person cannot be loaded with sin, and he can't bear it for you. How do you reconcile that with saying that Jesus came and sacrificed? And secondly, 
Uh, David, peace be upon him. Uh, we believe he, he, was, he was a great man. But according to the Old Testament, he committed adultery. And uh, he, he was responsible for the book of Psalms. And uh, he, he killed the lady's husband. And uh, then in, in Psalms 51, in the famous lamentation, he comes to God, he, he bears his soul and says, I, I, I did not come with a burnt offering. If you desired a burnt offering, a sacrifice, I would have brought it. But what I come with is a broken soul. He humbled himself in front of God and God forgave him. So if David didn't need a sacrifice while he committed adultery, killed a man, and, and basically got the woman pregnant too also, why do we need a sacrifice for, well, most of us will never even come close to that type of sin. David. Okay, that was, uh, that was several issues. I get some uh, brief responses. Um, you pointed out that, that David committed adultery. I just want to point out that Christians don't believe uh, prophets uh, are sinless or even mostly sinless, um, but prophets like David would uh, repent of their sins. As far as David uh, being able to be forgiven, um, I believe I already addressed this, but the Christian view is, yes, you can be for you could be forgiven in the Old Testament. You could be forgiven in the New Testament. Jesus could walk around and say to people that because you believe in him, your sins are forgiven. No question. Now, the, the issue is, does that mean this is all a part or a separate issue from uh, Jesus sacrifice? And the answer is no. No, we have the fundamental rule, as, as, as you would agree as a Muslim, is that scripture has to be interpreted with other scripture. If you read a passage of the Quran, I rip that uh, out of context. If that, my interpretation conflicts with what the rest of the Quran says, you're going to say, no, you can't ignore the rest of the Quran. You have to read this in the context of the rest of the Quran. Um, so if we're told that God can forgive you, and we're also told that the payment for those sins that God has forgiven... Uh, is, the, uh, sal is the work of Jesus Christ, which Jesus himself claimed, which the book of Isaiah said would happen, then we as Christians have to say we can't pick and choose what we want to believe. Yes, God can forgive people, but it's because of the work of Jesus Christ, as he said. Now, the issue of, uh, of, of Ezekiel, yes, you do have, and this is, this is very important, throughout the Old Testament you have, um, you have claim, well, you have various claims. You have claims that God will punish uh, the children to the third and fourth generation uh, for, for sins, but this is generally interpreted to mean that, that, that because in those days children survive to the third and fourth generation, they're all going to be part of uh, any judgment that falls upon the house. Uh, but as far as, as Ezekiel, the same rule would apply. We interpret scripture in the light of, of other scripture. And so we don't, I don't take you and go punish someone else for your sins. I don't uh, punish someone uh, for the sins of anyone in here. That's, that's correct. We don't do that. The Bible doesn't command us to do that. The Bible doesn't tell us to do that. But there is one, because of his work, who said he's going to do it. And since he's the, since he's the Lord who rose from the dead, we have to accept that message. So in Ezekiel, you have this general principle. You don't go around punishing people for the, for the sins of others. Uh, but uh, God is the one who, uh, who, Jesus is the one who voluntarily pays the price for sins, according to his own words. Thank you, David. Uh, Sammy, you have an extra half minute if you want to. Yeah, all I'll say to that is if, if that is all taught in the Old Testament that there will be the sacrifice later again, why, why were the people just surprised? Why did the Jews till now reject such a belief that a man will come and sacrifice himself for your sins? Now, we can't just ignore all of that. If that was being prophesied and taught, for 2,000 years, and even the Isaiah prophecy doesn't say anything about the uh, resurrection, so it's basically not really in the Old Testament. As David says, they're interpreting it that way, but if you just read it as, as it is, it's just not there. And the proof is that they were all surprised, and many of them didn't believe it. Thank you, Sammy. Next question. For David, uh, just a quick, quick question regarding the Muslim narrative where you keep on mentioning that uh, Allah deceived the people where he replaced Jesus on the cross with uh, mm -hmm. whoever, you know, the disputed person is. Yes. Uh, my understanding, and it's more of a response, I just wanted to see what your response is. Um, the Jews that conspired with the Romans uh, against Jesus, my understanding is uh, they were very headbent on crucifying him for a particular reason that anyone that hung from the tree would be forever cursed. Um, I would just want you to elaborate because my understanding is God being all-powerful. He has exalted 
uh, his servants before. Why is it so difficult for, for you to comprehend that God had done the same thing to preserve the uh, sanctity of Jesus by uh, preventing him from hanging from the tree? Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, uh, if he was to hang from the tree, then according to Jewish law, that he would be forever cursed, which would contradict, uh, you know, the, uh, Jesus, you know, Jesus being who he was. Okay. So, okay, just uh, so your, uh, if, if I gather correctly, your, um, your response was that why would I object to uh, God saving Jesus um, from that kind of death? Well, I don't have any objection to God saving someone from, uh, from some kind of uh, death that, that, that they don't deserve. Uh, but that's not, that wasn't my objection. The objection is, according to the uh, Orthodox Muslim view, um, God didn't just take Jesus and rescue him. That's not the problem. The idea is that Jesus is safe in heaven. There's no danger to Jesus whatsoever. And then God takes someone and disguises him. Again, usually Judas, but I think the earliest, I think something like nine out of the earliest ten traditions on this um, involves some version of, sub, uh, of uh, substitution theory, that Jesus was substituted with someone else. And that's, that's the standard view. I believe that's Sammy's view that Allah actually disguised someone else, made him look like Jesus, and that person was crucified on the cross. And so I'm stuck with this position. According to Islam, if Islam is true, if Surah 4, 157 and 158 is true, and Muhammad's, uh, and the, the, the traditions that go back to Muhammad are correct, then the reason more than a billion Christians today believe Jesus died by crucifixion is because, not because Allah saved Jesus and took him to heaven, but because Allah disguised someone else so that everyone thought that Jesus died by crucifixion. And there, again, in, in, in Islam, there's no point to it. There's no reason for the deception part. You could say there's a reason for the rescue part, but there's no reason for the deception part. And I have to say, why would Allah at least play some role in the beginning of a false religion? You know, Sam, we want to say there are other things, but uh, we're still stuck with a pointless deception that is deceived literally billions of people, and again, absolutely pointless. Thank you, David. Sammy? Yep, so as the questioner said, God saved Jesus. He exalted his prophet. And as David even mentioned, the Messiah would be a king. The Old Testament never says that the Messiah would die at the hands of his enemies like a common criminal. So in Islam, the Messiah is exalted because he, in fact, conquers his enemies by being rescued against the conspiracy of the Romans and the Pharisees who wanted him dead. Now again, there was no deception and no trickery because as I've said 10 times, if you simply believe that Jesus died on the cross as a martyr, which many scholars say is what Luke teaches, no atonement, if you believe that, there wouldn't be a big problem. But you don't simply believe he died on the cross as a martyr. You believe he died and rose in three days for the sins of mankind. Mm -hmm. Now where do you get that belief from? You don't get that from the Quran, you get that from Paul. That's like if I die today and you simply believe I die as a martyr, but then someone comes along and says, oh no, but he rose and, uh, for, and he died and rose for your sin. That's something completely different. You should blame the person who came up with that theology not the other part. And as I said, there are many historians who believe that Jesus died on the cross, but they don't believe He resurrected. But now as a Christian, you believe He resurrected. Now who made you believe in that? Not the Quran, not Allah, but Paul. So they're two completely different things. And as Paul said, the central tenet of Christianity is what? It's the resurrection. Without the resurrection, your faith is in vain. It's not simply about Jesus being on the cross. It's about Him rising from the dead. And that comes from Paul. The Quran says nothing remotely close to that. And that's what I would say. Thank you, Sammy. Next question. I'll try to keep this to 60 seconds, sorry. Going back to what this gentleman said, uh, David was punished all of his life for the adultery that he committed and for the murder that he committed. Wait a minute. Real quick, uh, his child was taken from him, the sword was never ever to, uh, able to depart from him or from his household. So that's the punishment and the sacrifice that he had, uh, according to what I understand. I might be wrong, I'll count on you to correct me later. 
going to what you were saying about official church doctrine not starting until the third century, I would disagree because when you look at Paul, Peter, John, all of the disciples, they were the church and they created, I don't want to say they created, they were the ones preaching official church doctrine and they preached that Jesus Christ died, rose again, and died for our sins. So the official church doctrine right after Jesus died was that philosophy. It didn't start in the third century. So I'll start with a question. Uh, during your rebuttal, you said that Peter did not call Jesus God and that his divinity was not official until the third century. Am I mistaken in believing that Flavius Josephus in the first century said that his followers, meaning Jesus' followers, worshipped him and claimed he was God? And then going back to the other statement real quick, Peter went about claiming Jesus died for our sins and was God after he says that he rose again. So even though he may have not completely understood all of it, he did later. And I'll leave it at that, but I got a lot of questions. Let's just do this one for now. Yeah, we'll stick. All right, again, back to the point. I didn't say that nobody believed he was God. Uh, the point I'm saying is that it wasn't official until the third century, and you had all of these other people who didn't believe he's God. And what's very interesting, as you would tell me, the church couldn't come together until the third century because you were being persecuted. So that's why it took so long. Well, if that's the case, and if you could gather in the Council of Nicaea, why wasn't the Holy Spirit included? in that council. You had the opportunity. So still the theology was being formed even while you were not being persecuted. So that comes back. And as for the church, there was another church, the Church of Jerusalem, in which James was there. And we all know James's church was opposed to Paul's. The followers of James church tried to kill Paul. That's when many historians say that the split happened. When Paul said, I'm a Roman citizen, when they tried to kill him. And even Paul writes in his own letters that many churches rejected him and did not believe in him. And he, told, he was telling his own followers, don't believe these other gospels. Don't believe these other people who are preaching a different message to what I'm preaching. So even Paul's early documents is showing that there were these big differences. And that there were other churches who were teaching a different doctrine to what he was teaching. And again, the church of Jerusalem. So again, let me make it clear. I'm not saying nobody believed in what you believe. The point I'm saying is that there were many other people who believed that he wasn't God and so forth. And it wasn't until the third century when what you believe became official orthodoxy. And if something contradicted that, it would be official heresy. And even by the third century, by the way, the canon of the Bible was not fully settled. So that's another point as well. Thank you, Sammy. David, did you want to respond? Uh, yeah, uh, the followers of James tried to kill the Apostle Paul. Any Christian ever heard anything remotely resembling this? Uh, no, because there's nothing remotely resembling this anywhere in history. I don't know where uh, that comes from, but it doesn't come from anything uh, actually historical. And if we're just going to, you know, say things, well, you know, I could say... Uthman tried to kill Muhammad or something like that. You can invent all kinds of things. Uh, don't ever forget that James called himself a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is his half-brother. Are you going to call yourself a bondservant of the Lord, your brother? Of course you're not. But that's what James referred to Jesus as, so he's certainly not taking him as a mere human being. Uh, Sammy, again, uh, still... I think confused about this Council of Nicaea issue. Well, yeah, you couldn't get together uh, until the year 325, and so that's when Orthodoxy uh, started. He says, why wasn't the Holy Spirit included? Look, we, we, have, we have records. We have records of the Council of Nicaea. We know what was discussed there. The main issue uh, was whether Jesus was one with the Father in the sense of, uh, in the sense of, uh, Jesus was God, uncreated, or whether Jesus was the first creation who then created all kinds of things, and that was the minority view, a very small minority of Christians from kind of out in the middle of nowhere, uh, held that Jesus was the first creation, and that he then created everything. Uh, but the vast majority believed in what we regard as Orthodox Christianity, despite the fact that they came from all over the place and never gotten together, they finally get together and they agree on 
uh, Christian doctrine. But notice, neither one of those views agree with Islam, and the, you know, one of them would be polytheism, which both Christians and Muslims would reject. So the Council of Nicaea, based on opening the first century documents and saying, what does the Bible teach, agreed on the orthodox doctrines of Christianity that we have today. Thank you, David. Uh, let's try to take the rest of our questions really quickly. Let's do one minute responses instead of two minute responses, just so we can fit in uh, our last three questions. Uh, my question is for Sammy. Uh, regarding the teaching of Islam on how somebody was replaced uh, in Jesus' place, we see that the Quran actually teaches that Jesus was to be crucified, the Jews wanted to crucify him. So that there was a reason that they wanted to crucify him. One question is, why did they want to crucify him? Because according to Christianity, they wanted to crucify him because he claimed to be God. And if it, if it wasn't, like you say, it's not Allah who deceived the people, if it wasn't, I want, to, I want to give you a quick scenario. Just imagine somebody, you know, that, that you know, you've seen every day, he's preached to you, you've heard his voice, you know, and he's being crucified in front of your face, you know what I mean? Just like nails being hit in his hands, and he's screaming out in pain. Now, my question is, what, what on earth, other than God, I mean, if you tell me Satan is the one who deceived people, then you're saying Satan has the power to control your free will and, and what you see. Who else other than God would it be that, that could deceive somebody, you know, that somebody else was being crucified when you just saw it in front of your face? You know? <coughs> That's my question. All right. About this whole deception, now we need to come to a main point because if any of you read the Bible, the Old Testament, Yahweh deceives people as well. So now if you want to be consistent uh, with Satan, then you must also now throw your argument back to yourself because I don't believe your argument, but obviously you believe your argument. So. Will you liken Yahweh to Satan because he deceives people in the Old Testament? And secondly, the, point, uh, the first point, why did they want to kill Jesus? They wanted to kill Jesus because he was preaching against the Pharisees. He was exposing the establishment, their hypocrisy, how they were being bad against the people. As Matthew says, he, was leading the, he accused the Pharisees of leading people to hell. He called them dead inside. He called them the sons of Satan. Uh, he said, um, uh, what, he called them serpents. He called them all of these things, and he was against them. So obviously, he even um, went to the temple and threw the money charges upside down. So all of these things obviously would want them to want to kill Jesus. That's the main reason as to why they wanted him dead. And they killed other prophets as well. Even Jesus accused them. They killed other prophets, and he accused them of even bearing the blood of other prophets who their forefathers killed. So now the question is, why did they also kill those other prophets? There's a pattern. Yeah. Thank you, Sammy. How much time do I get? Uh, a minute, a little bit more than a minute if you want. Okay, uh, well it's an excellent question because according to Christianity, uh, Jesus is going around making claims that only God should be making and that is, a, if you want a death sentence in first century Israel, that is about uh, the best you could do. Uh, Sammy's version is that they wanted to kill Jesus because he was hurting their feelings by condemning their hypocrisy. Well, the problem is the charges against Jesus were blasphemy. The charges against him at his trial were blasphemy over and over again. It's blasphemy, and that's just what the historical evidence says. Sammy says, well, Yahweh deceives people in the Old Testament. If you go to the actual story where you have this, uh, the people are believing in the false prophets. And then it says that uh, uh, Yahweh sent uh, a deceiving spirit. But notice what he did in, in the Old Testament. He immediately sent them a true prophet to inform them and say, here's the true prophet of Yahweh. Who are you going to believe, him or this deceiving spirit? And notice he sends them a true messenger. And that's the problem. If God is going to trick someone for uh, some important purpose or... Uh, you know, something like that, I, I don't have a problem with it. If, you know, if someone's trying to kill me and God tricks them into thinking I ran one way when I ran a different way, I don't have a problem with that. The point is deceiving people for no reason, start helping, helping start a false religion, uh, leading billions of people astray for no reason. That's the problem. Thank you, David. We have two more questions. Let's try to ask quickly, please. Uh, I'm just reading from the Bible... Uh, this is for Sammy, Second uh, um, Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us what to do is right. And uh, 
Revelations 22, verse 18. Uh, everyone who hears the word of prophecy written in this book, if anyone adds anything to what is written here, God will add to the person the plagues described in this book. And if anyone removes any of the words from this book of prophecy, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city and are described in this book. So it's Revelations 22, 18, 19. <coughs> um, I'm just saying that uh, um, The truth is set you free. Uh, this is the truth. Uh, this is what I believe. And um, um, I guess this is. Did you want to respond, Sammy? No. Okay. Uh, we can take our next question. Last question. Uh, yes, Sammy. I'm still confused about it. I'm still confused about Islam's uh, ethical basis for Allah to forgive sin. Uh, is it just his arbitrary fiat power that it's okay for David to be forgiven for his adultery and homicide, and Muhammad for his lustful heart, but not people in this room uh, who are just as sincerely repented about their sin but are not Muslim? Is that unjust? And uh, how do you not just sweep sin under the carpet? Uh, first of all, we as Muslims don't believe David did any of those things. Now, it doesn't matter. If anyone sins and they repent, and they don't follow up their sins with more sins, and they truthfully repent, then they will be saved. Now, it's the same thing with a Christian, uh, Orthodox Christianity. Even if I'm a good person and I repent, but I don't believe in the sacrifice of Jesus, I won't be saved. So, that's the same thing. But Muslim scholars teach that if you are a non-Muslim that you're not just automatically uh, doomed to hell. There's a list of conditions. Even if you hear the message of Islam, there are other conditions. Did you hear the message properly? Was it conveyed properly? You know, or was it unclear? All of those factors come in. So <clears throat> we don't just judge anyone. You know, if you're a non-Muslim and you're a good person, Islam teaches that God will also be good with you at the same time. And that you won't just be uh, abandoned and so forth. What happens in the afterlife? Uh, I'm not a judge, and uh, we don't know. So, who knows what happens in the future? That's what I'd say to, and that's what uh, most uh, Islamic scholarship would say. What happens in the future? Only God knows. Thank you, Sammy. David. Uh, well, it's not just Allah who knows. He might know the specifics, but we know, according to Islam, what Allah is going to do. And I'll confess, I, I, I just can't make sense of it because you, you, you bring up the sweeping sins under the rug, but you also have uh, the idea that God is going to take uh, horrible sinners and punish uh, Christians and Jews. And notice what it says. Notice what Muhammad says here. Uh, three groups on the resurrection day. So we know what's going to happen, according to Muhammad. One sort will enter paradise without rendering account of their deeds. So they just get to walk right in. No, uh, no judgment or uh, anything like that. Uh, another sort will be reckoned an easy account and admitted into paradise. So they get an easy judgment. Some get no judgment. Some get an easy judgment. And then the horrible, really horrible sinners bearing sins like great mountains. Well, Allah takes those and puts them on the back of Jews and Christians. So for some of the people, for some of the Muslims. They just get to walk right into paradise, no judgment whatsoever. And for others, toss those sins on the Jews and Christians. You have the, the, the problem either way. Thank you, David. And thank you, Sammy. Thank you to the audience for your questions tonight. Uh, we will now proceed to the final part of the debate. So you guys can uh, get up and leave and go home. Uh, five minute closing remarks from our debaters. And uh, David, we can begin with you. Well, I'd like to uh, thank Sammy for um, his participation here and thank everyone for, uh, for the good questions and for um, you know, sticking through a two-hour debate. Uh, it's good. What else could we be doing that would be uh, more important than this tonight? 
Um, but I think we've seen, we have two views on the table. There are other alternatives out there, but the, the positions that are on the table for our consideration tonight, uh, we have two. And according to one, uh, God is perfect in justice, perfect in mercy, and must punish all sin, but is willing to do anything to whatever it takes to forgive us. And the solution to retain those perfect attributes is that he voluntarily uh, pays the price for sins. And Muslims have a tremendous problem with this. But again, I mean, think what you'd be willing uh, to do. If you were uh, walking down the street, well, suppose you were king of the world. Suppose you were master of the world, you were dressed in royal robes and you're walking down in the street and you see your, your kid drowning in a filthy pool of mud. Uh, would your royal robes matter to you? Wouldn't you do whatever it takes? Uh, wouldn't you toss those robes aside and jump in and save the child that you love? Uh, of course you would, and that's your love. That's your finite, limited love. Imagine what a being who is perfect and infinite in love, what would that being be willing to do? Uh, I say whatever it takes. And that's what we find in Christianity. And the Muslim wants to say, well, God doesn't need to do that. Well, if he doesn't do that, then sin gets swept under the rug and then he's not perfectly just. So how does God do that? Uh, well, I find no answer in Islam, but I find an answer in Christianity. Um, so we have God's perfect attributes being retained in Christianity. We have a message uh, that fits with all of the evidence that we have, a message about someone dying on the cross for sins, rising from the dead, and claiming to be divine. All of our early evidence fits with this position. And think about it, according to Christianity, God had a mission for Jesus. God was completely victorious. Jesus came into the world, completed his mission perfectly. Jesus was completely victorious. He chose followers who would carry this message fearlessly. They were completely victorious. They went to their bloody deaths and would not back down. That's the message of Christianity. God is victorious from beginning to end. God is glorified from beginning to end. And then our Muslim friends tell us, ah, but there's the alternative. Jesus didn't die by crucifixion. Allah tricked people into believing it. That's where that view arose. But the Apostle Paul came along later and corrupted other parts. So it wasn't Allah corrupting it by himself. He had a partner in crime. He's going to, uh, he's had the Apostle Paul also deceiving. Actually, that's not much better. Because think about the implication there. God sends Jesus into the world. Jesus spends all these years, and according to Islam, Jesus started preaching at birth. So he started preaching for, for 30 years. And then Allah comes down, tricks, Je I mean, tricks Jesus' followers into believing that he died by crucifixion, and then just can't protect his message from the Apostle Paul. God sends Jesus into this world. The work doesn't get done. Jesus doesn't accomplish anything that lasts. Muhammad has to come along six centuries later to fix the mess created by Allah and the Apostle Paul. And you put all of this together, what happened in the first century? Nothing. You ended up with the largest false religion due to Allah's deception and the Apostle Paul's deception. And God wasn't victorious. Jesus was a miserable failure. His followers couldn't protect the message from the Apostle Paul or Allah. This is the alternative? This is the alternative where we have one view that glorifies God. He's victorious from beginning to end. We have another that portrays Allah, God as a deceiver, and Jesus as a miserable failure. Even if we had no evidence on the table, even if we had no evidence to support either view, we'd have to choose the Christian view just in light of the theology involved. And when we add to the fact that every shred of evidence we have tells us Jesus claimed to be divine, that he died on the cross for sins, and that he rose from the dead, and so we have all of the evidence confirming Christianity, uh, I don't think we have uh, any reasonable choice than to conclude that the message of Jesus Christ is found in the documents of the New Testament. That is the only way to be uh, faithful to God is to believe in the message that has been preserved right now. Thank you, David. <laughs> Sam, you have five minutes for concluding remarks. All right. Um, thank you for that. Um, tonight was an interesting debate. And although we disagree, but uh, at the end of the day, even if you disagree with me, or even if you agree with me, at the end of the day, I'm not telling any of you to reject Jesus. And that's what's important. Even if you follow what I follow, you'd still have Jesus. He'd still be a part of your faith. 
and so forth. So I'm not telling you to become atheists or to start hating and rejecting on Jesus. Now tonight's debate was very interesting because David brought up a lot of points about Jesus. That Jesus died for our sins and that He was divine. Those are the two key messages behind it. Now what it all comes down to is we've gone over it so many times tonight. But the fact of the matter is there are big problems with those beliefs. The first problem with the supposed divinity of Jesus. That wasn't officially declared by the third century. That's an official fact. Secondly, officially there were other Christians who didn't believe that Jesus was God. And I quoted you from the Gospels. I quoted them from the Gospels. So let's not ignore that. I'm not just quoting a bunch of heretics. I even quoted Peter who didn't call Jesus God. I quoted you the three wise men. I quoted you the flocks, the flock of people outside Jerusalem, the thousands of people he fed. None of them believed he was God. And these people were all alive during Jesus' time. The second point about the crucifixion and the death of Jesus. I'm glad that tonight, and this is a fact, David was not able to produce one single verse from the Old Testament which says the Messiah will die and rise in three days. We went over Isaiah 53. I specifically asked him in front of all of you, where does Isaiah 53 say anything about a resurrection? He did not bring it. And what does Paul say? The resurrection is the central tenet of Christianity. And David cannot show that from the Old Testament. And secondly, even in the New Testament, the disciples were surprised. They were shocked. They were never expecting that to happen. Why is that? If Jesus clearly taught them that. And the answer is clear. It's because He never did. Unless they just got amnesia all of a sudden. I believe God gives His message clearly. And again, back to the point of God deceives. There are more references in the Old Testament that talks about God's deception other than the example David brought for you. And back to the Qur'an, when God saved Jesus, He didn't trick anybody into believing in Christianity. Again, there are historical scholars who believe that Jesus died, but they don't believe He died for your sins. Now why is that? Because they don't follow Paul who taught you that. So nobody is deceiving anybody. And at the end of the day, what was the message of Jesus? It was pure monotheism. All the verses I brought for you are right in the Bible and they're backed with the Old Testament. They reconcile with each other. There's not something that just contradicts everything before it. There was a way to get sin forgiven before the crucifixion. That's something consistent. Jesus was teaching His people how to be saved. By believing in God's monotheism, by being a good person, by doing righteous acts, by having your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees. Nothing about believing in my resurrection or my death. And even again, back to the Council of Nicaea, why wasn't the Trinity declared in the Council of Nicaea? More problems for central Christianity. So again, I'll just end it with this. We as Muslims love Jesus. Even if you disagree with everything I'm saying, it doesn't matter because I'm not telling you to reject Jesus. And I end it by that, that people should accept Jesus for what He said. He was a prophet. He didn't, he didn't say, I am God. He prayed to God. He said He is from God. And that's what we believe. If Jesus was alive today, I would bow my head with Him when He prayed to God. And when He said, my God and your God. That's the message that I'm calling you to, which is the message of Jesus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samuel. Let's give another round of applause to both of our debaters. I'd like to once again thank you all for coming out tonight, spending your Tuesday night with us. I'd like to thank Pastor McGee. Um, for, for letting us use the church. Uh, and if you enjoyed this debate, tomorrow we'll be having a debate at uh, Henry Ford Community College. The topic is, is Muhammad a good role model for society? That'll be happening at noon in uh, Henry Ford Community College, room L14. 
Same debaters, David Wood and Sammy, will be joining us there. So feel free to come on by and check that out.